Yo, what's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode. Today, I'm with my friend. You're on again, Mr. Naz Nuro. What's going on? How are you, Darren? I'm good, bruv. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's been a busy few weeks, but I've been excited to, uh, yeah, talk to you and catch up. Oh, last sick, time. sick, wicked. We, um, you last spoke with uh, my clients, right? You gave a nice little seminar, pretty much, right? We did like a Q&A together to my clients and, mate, they, they loved you. Did you get a lot of love on socials after? So much love. And you know what? They asked some of the smartest questions. I felt so challenged. But yeah, now I'm, I'm so, uh, yeah, I enjoy this so much and the love that I got was amazing. So, yeah. Th does it make you realize like um, more of what troubles like general population are having with um, like, I guess, a lot of habit stuff that I guess yeah. include and include the brain, right? Which is what you are. You're, you're, you're training to be a... Yeah. I'm training to be a, finish my PhD and yeah. help people out. Uh, with... So is that when you can officially say you're a neuroscientist? Uh, no. I can officially say I'm a doctor. Oh, sick. That's the difference, yeah. So well, you can say you're a neuroscientist now, right? Because I'm doing research in neuroscience. So my technically God. it fits in, in, into that. Uh, but yeah, as soon as I finish my PhD, which shouldn't be too long, I'm, I'm writing it up now. Then, uh, yeah, doctor. I, I'm going to have to ask everyone, do a poll. Dr. Nasnur or Nasnur? I don't know. We'll have to think about but it. Doctor's pretty cool, though. Yeah. Saying okay. doctor, is, doc, saying doctor is pretty cool. And what is the one of the most common things you're seeing? What's the, one of the most common things that you saw, like, with the questions that you got from my clients that kind of all linked together? Yeah, I think most people struggled with motivation, um, struggled with getting habits going. Um, that's just a common problem that most people have, and that's the thing about neuroscience. Once you understand the brain a little bit you can start making some adjustments and help people achieve the goals they have, they want to achieve. Yeah. And would you say each, is each brain very, very different or does a lot of, is everyone's brain got a lot of similarities? So brains are very similar in many ways and very different in others. And things that shape up your brain include your experiences, your nutrition, your exercise habits, um, whether you've experienced childhood trauma, whether you've experience substance abuse so as a whole we have some similarities but the brain is very plastic to change okay and depending on your behaviors your brain uh changes and, and adapts I'm, I'm sure it changes as well with environment right environment is, is a big one so previously everyone thought that the brain is like super sort of static whichever brain you're born with you're stuck with that brain as research in neuroscience has improved people have understood that the brain is super flexible especially in, in childhood but in adulthood too, uh, you can actually get changes to the structure of your brain based on your lifestyle and your experiences. Okay. You said child, um, childhood trauma. Yeah. Now I've just come from pretty much a war zone in Turkey yeah, yeah, yeah. after the earthquake. Would you say a lot of those kids will have a lot of trauma? Um, yeah, it's a very, very sad situation. And certainly, I mean, you've been in the, in the fields actually, like what are the sort of things you saw? So we can talk about that. Like, I guess... It was, it's weird, isn't it? Because like mm. you almost feel like when I was there, there's on the news and everything. They're saying there's thousands of people dead. They're saying like there's yeah. uh, twenty three or thirty three thousand right now. But bro, I think one hundred percent it will go past a hundred thousand. It's sure. I think it's impossible for it not to. Like the locals were telling me, and the people on the ground were telling me, there's from the whole region eleven to thirteen thousand apartments mm. have gone down. Mm. Those apartments are it's not they're not the richest areas. Mm. There's gonna be a lot of family members in like one flat, let alone yeah. the whole apartment. And what I saw from the kids was, I think it, it hasn't hit them yet. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously the ones without their parents now, mm -hmm. they're obviously going to uh, see some absence from them, but I don't think it's actually hit them yet. And I, and I was, and in my head I was seeing everything. I was like, there isn't much we can do now in the sense of like, other than providing food, water, warm clothes and whatnot and like shelter for the time being. But like, I don't know how that city is going to come back alive. Maybe 20, 25 years. Like, mm. I don't know. It's mm. a crazy. And then those kids, like what, I mean, what, what sort of effects can a kid have? Like what, what, what effects would, what negative effects would a brain have mm. with a child experiencing something crazy like that? Or would it pop mm. up later on? Uh, that's a very good question. Obviously a very sad story. Um, the way you look at it is, Childhood trauma has been associated with negative psychological, neurological, 
and physiological effects. So three different departments of science we're going to talk about. With the psychological effects, we're talking about an increase in risk of PTSD, an increase in risk of anxiety and depression. Okay. So those children already are at risk of those things. Not, not all the children, but the children that have seen the most trauma. In terms of physiological changes, you're going to get these children being more commonly in a state of fight or flight. So, you know, when your body is, is in that flight or flight mode, when you're yeah. like anxious, people would, or children with trauma tend to have that experience over and over again. So their body is always ready for action, always ready for combating stress at all time. Yeah. And that spikes your cortisol in your blood. And the more cortisol is active or, or, or higher, a little bit of cortisol is okay. It gets you sort of ready for performance. High and constant level of cortisol associated with childhood um, trauma will result in shrinkage of the brain. Okay. So make the brain smaller and further associated with those psychological conditions that I mentioned. Oh, snap. Mm. And that is obviously going to affect pretty much their whole life. So that's going to affect their memory. That's going to affect their language. That's going to affect their problem solving. Uh, once again, every case is different. But the more severe the childhood trauma, the bigger the problems on the brain. But what's really interesting that I, um, I wanted to put across, there are different competing hypotheses in this field. On one hand, we know that the child brain is very plastic and malleable for change. During childhood, your brain transforms and changes every single day with every single experience. So one of the arguments is traumatic experiences in children can be overcome better because the brain can overcome and adapt to those, to those issues. And you often find that in some groups who have experienced, let's say, um, an injury. What happens is other brain areas responsible for a particular function take over and are more active to support the original lost function. So children have this potential ability to overcome trauma. The other hypothesis in line with this is that these children have experienced trauma and their brains are once again very plastic, which means that critical window of childhood and adolescence is when your brain undergoes most of its changes. And if it goes wrong, you tend to have long, irreversible and permanent changes to your brain. You find this often with chronic users of substance abuse, okay. alcohol, cannabis. People often ask me, um, I've smoked cannabis, uh, am I going to be okay? And the research suggests that generally, depending on, on obviously the ratio of THC to CBD, there are multiple variables. But if you smoked really heavily as a teenager, yeah. you're probably going to have more long-term problems than if you do as an adult, for example. Okay. And this might be a silly question, mm. but could there be any positive effect on a child's brain from experiencing something so potentially traumatic? Because, you know, sometimes it can make, like, potentially a kid in invincible, right? When they, If they grow up with the right sort of, I guess, right sort of direction, right support, they can grow up to fulfill life in better than most of us by experiencing something so then or are they too young to understand that so depending on the age obviously that's a that's a key factor um i would say from a brain point of view the effects are most likely going to be negative and okay. there's no way around that but from a psychological point point of view with the right support with the right, right um social circle community around them there are ways to overcome that difficulty and perhaps um overcome and, and, and do better in, in some form of way that, that, that is possible. You often, um, one particular case that comes to mind is uh, during Grenfell uh, Tower, which is a horrific incident, yeah. some of the children had to sit the exams the next day. Jesus. And some of them got like A stars and A's and it's absolutely amazing. So um, yeah, so credit to them. But as a general rule in terms of like brain health, the, the the child brain brain or the, the adolescent brain is there to be protected and for it to develop and and uh, continue to to progress in, in its optimal path. And would genetics play a big part on how they move forward from this? So, for example, you've mentioned this to me before, another mm. on uh, when we were talking, where you you would say that I've got quite a positive outlook, potentially mm. naturally or genetically. Mm. Now, would say a kid maybe similar to me or 
their parents were very positive people and uh, looked at everything from a positive angle and whatnot, would they be adapting or coming out of this very differently? Would genetics play a big part on this? Or is it such a big event that no matter what happens, it's just going to affect a kid for, for a long time? Um, it's hard to fully sort of distinguish the effects of gen genetics and environment. By the way, when you're talking about, let's say, your personal experience, you're saying that your parents were, for instance, um, you know, encouraged you to be this wonderful person that you are. Um, it's not just purely genetics. It's also your environment within the household. Mm. So genetics, we're talking about um, things that are predisposed out of your control. But your family's interaction with you is obviously something that's outside of your genetics. It's connected, but it's, it's outside. So one classic way of looking at it is uh, you have these twin studies where basically they study twins and these twins have 100% of um, the genetic material that's similar. And what you do find is in some cases, for example, um, when you separate the twins or if they've been separated at birth, uh, the environment takes over. The environment, the different environments of these children result in different sort of traits in some ways, overriding the effects of genetics. Whereas in other cases, uh, separating these twins uh, naturally through birth. Um, what you find is whatever parent they had had have very little effect for them to develop a certain, let's say, co um, condition. Okay. Um, but answering your question, I think um, there there is going to be variability in response and in how the children um, navigate through this difficult situation. But as a general thing, trauma is absolutely devastating for the childhood brain um, and for the adolescent brain. What with, about, go on, sorry. And with sort of long lasting often <clears throat> effects, I'd say. Okay. And what about the adults? Like, they know obviously what's happening more than the kids. Mm -hmm. Is their effect, the way they're going to be affected, does it, it's, this sounds bad, but like mm -hmm. in my head, people are like doing, what are you going to do that? I was like, I don't know. When I saw the kids, I was like, mm -hmm. you know what? Raising some money for the kids mm -hmm. is probably the way to go because, and it's going to sound weird, maybe it sounds a bit mm. horrible, but in my head, when I think of old people there, yeah. I'm like, not that they're done, but I'm like, they're old now. Like their impact on their life after like, after 50, after 60 in countries like Turkey, no offense to anyone that's listening, where those people live is very different to the Western world. You can live your dreams here and go at 60, it's not too late. You can still accomplish your dreams. Well, in six, when you're 60 in Turkey, in an area like that, there isn't much more you can really achieve other than mm. like looking after your family and having like mm. a somewhat decent job, you know? Mm. Minimum wages there is, mm. is nothing, bro. It's like mm. 400 pounds a month or something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. How is it going to affect them in the sense of, is it just like, there's no point even then? Because there's no way in hell every person that has gone through uh, that traumatic event is going to get support. Like it's mm. just impossible. And I feel like most people are going to go, oh, the adults, fuck them. Mm. They're done now. Mm. That's it. Mm. Do you reckon it's going to be mm. a lot worse for them? Mm. Um, well, what you have to also take into account is you mentioned that there, there might not be some help, but cultures such as the Turkish culture, um, they tend to be very community-based. And just my discussions with you and even uh, coming across um, articles and people talking about it, about it, you've seen a, a big community getting together. Even in North London, when you're sort of watching how the Turkish community has come together to help um, the people in Turkey. So in many ways, um, Turkey does benefit or Syria does benefit from that, from that sort of collectivist culture of everyone being uh, together. Uh, I'm sure you'd say in many cases, the grandparents are living uh, with the parents and, and, and so on. So, so everybody's living in the community together. And one of the strongest way to overcome um, anxiety, uh, sort of trauma, is social bonding and social interaction. Yeah. And that's the number one sort of, I don't want to say number one, I, I always say number one because there's three things sort of competing about uh, all the time about what are the most useful things you want to have in your life wherever you are, um, exercise, sleep, and social interaction. Okay. And social interaction is so important. And as, especially at this time, uh, these people need to be around each other to support each other. And there are ways to overcome these kind of issues because we, we have seen 
bad events happen in the past in, in other places. Um, but it's likely that some of the effects are going to last a long time, even perhaps past generation and generation, because there's evidence that trauma can be passed um, by generation by generation. It's called ancestry something, isn't it? It's called ancestry yeah. trauma or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, it's funny you say that. Yeah, you're right. And Turkish, Kurdish and like Syria, they, I mean, if you're poor, all you have is community and family. Right, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So when I went to one of the villages, um, you see them in the tents, all the old people in the tents, mm. they're all huddled up together around the fire mm. and just talking. Like literally what you just said, just mm. letting it all out. Mm. And not holding back either. Mm. Like letting it out. And in my head, I thought, imagine if they didn't let it out. Yeah. It'd be way worse, right? Mm -hmm. It'd be way worse. And I think things there slowly will, um, communities will come together and I think yeah. there will be a lot of support. Hopefully to the right places and yeah. how to, because it's such a mess. Sure. And um, it's quite difficult to get there, isn't it? In uh, in that border, isn't it? A little yeah, bit. Yeah. So initially, we thought when we landed, me and my dad landed in Istanbul because we were mm. like, we're not going to go there and stay in a fucking flat, are we? Mm. <laughs> like, it's not mm. going to happen. Dad's got a car in Turkey. Mm. He drove out a car. Um, mm. My dad's funny guy, bro. <laughs> my dad bought. Um, he's he's his friend's got like a mini cab office in it, like a taxi office, like black cabs and stuff, like yeah. separates in North London. Yeah, yeah. So when the old taxis get rid of them, my dad was like, yeah, let me buy one that you guys are not using anymore. So he buys like an old London taxi. No way. Right? And he's like, let me just take this to Turkey, leave it in the village. We'll need it to carry shit around. Sure. And we'll carry old people around. You know what? Sure. He bought it for what? Two, three thousand pounds or wow. something. He drove it all the way there and left it there. Yeah. And like, I always get mad at my dad for this. I'm like, dad, we don't need to do this. Like, yeah, yeah. like we can afford like a decent car. Like, yeah, yeah. He's like, no, you don't know it will come in need. And yeah. it did. <laughs> it yeah. did already. So we landed in Istanbul. We picked the car up from my uncle's house mm. and we drove all the way up to Karamanmaraş, which mm. was about a good eight to 10 hour drive. Wow. Straight there overnight. Um, there's people that we found on uh, the flight, friends of my dad, um, just randomly, mm. people that have lost a lot of family. Mm. Mm. And so five, six of us just jumped in the car. Mm. My dad knows some of uh, one of them, but the others actually we didn't know. We were just helping people out. Yeah. Just like jump on. Like you said, community just come together and sure. we just drove up and uh, dropped people where they needed to and then supported people that we need. And we, we ended up slept in a car for like four days. My lower back is still in pieces. Wow. But um, it was definitely worth the trip. Yeah. Now, do you think mm. my brain is going to get affected by this? Um, to some extent, obviously, I mean, depending on the things that you've seen and experienced, it's likely to have uh, left some form of an impact um, in you. Uh, the other thing to say is obviously you have an emotional bond to Turkey. Uh, I remember you saying that's the city where your dad grew up. Is that is that right? Yeah, or? yeah. It's like it's where I used to go as a kid okay. every summer. Pretty much yeah. that city, the one that's ruined. Yeah, yeah. So it's likely also that that emotional connection to that place will also make sort of some of those memories um, that you've acquired during that time um, even stronger and more uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, We'll have to see. You'll have to tell me how, how you're coping with this. Yeah. Um, yeah, it would be very interesting to, yeah, it was, to see. It, it was weird. When I, when I got back and I was like in an airport and stuff, Yeah, it was weird being in a real yeah. safer environment. Mm. It was like, it definitely makes you see all this a little bit mm. differently. Like mm. just, it sounds fucking cringy. It's like mm. it doesn't sound cringy, but it's just obviously a typical, oh, it really makes me appreciate life yeah. more. But it does. <laughs> yeah. You know, once you see yeah. that much pain, and bro, I saw a lot of dead bodies. Sure. Like, I saw this one moment, we were, we were, I was driving, my dad was sitting next to me, and I saw a group of four cars following this van. Mm. The van, the back of the van was open, and there was like bags. And I was like, well, my dad was looking, I was like, what's that? What's in there, dad? Mm. He's looking over, I'm looking, and I'm like, what is it? Like, have they got tents or shopping or mm. something to take back? Bro, it was like eight bodies. Mm. All their families following, driving them back to Syria. Wow. Mad. And yeah. I was just like, and in my head, I was like, this feels so surreal. Yeah, yeah. But like, this is the reality yeah. of these people. Yeah. And they have to like live with that. These people got nothing, man. They got no money, no contacts. Do you think it took you like a, li a little bit of time for it to actually hit you um, after you've, you've experienced it? Or at the time you were like, oh, it's like this. I, I took it in. Mm. later when I was like sitting down and you know those moments where you sit down sure, yeah. 
then I was like, raw, what yeah. did I just see? Yeah. Like, that is pretty crazy. Yeah. And like, and then I thought, in my head, I mentally like tried to put myself in their position. Yeah. And if I was doing that with no money, no nothing, mm. how the hell would I feel? Like, what hope would you have for life? Mm. You know, some of these people now, mate, you're walking past apartments, yeah, mm. in the city with their family members sitting outside. There's like a curb section in the middle where it splits the road and then there's apartments. Turkey's one of these mm. places where they put apartments every fucking place. Sure. There's family sitting there. Mother's sitting there. There was one mother screaming. Like, I, I can't, I can't, I can't forget her voice. Yeah. She's like screaming his name mm. in Turkish, being like, Niye ben den saklanıyorsun? Mm. Which is like, why are you hiding from me? Why are you playing hide in the seek, son? Yeah. Why? And I, and I could just look, I looked into her eyes and she was just gone, bro. Yeah. Like, you can just tell. Yeah. And I was just like, how's this mother going to like come out of this, you mm. know? And you remember those things. But I think luckily, I've got good people around me. Mm. I've got good family. Mm. I've got good friends. I've got all my Jets guys, you mm. know. I've, I'll be fine, obviously, yeah. you know. Yeah. But obviously my mind is naturally on mm. how those people are going to be, yeah. which is, I guess, like the tougher part. But you have to live on, right? We have to live on, keep doing what we need to do. And whatever I do, stuff like this, can allow me to help more people, hopefully, in the future. You know, like, raised a bit of money, which is cool. And then I want to continue that. And, you know, I don't want it to be one of those things where it's like, oh, eight weeks later, there was a study, apparently after eight weeks, these sort of, like, big events, and um, they get forgotten very mm. quickly. I want to do my best to not yeah. let it get forgotten, you know? You know, remember, um, that text that you written on the actual fundraiser page? Yeah. I could just... It, when I read it, I could just imagine you saying that to me. And that's when I knew, like, this was actually very, like, raw from the heart and very genuine. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. it was literally word by word, the dear and I know. <laughs> you didn't try to overcomplicate it too much. Um, but I remember seeing everything that you said was pre pretty much sort of in line with your character. Uh, did you ever expect it to, like, you know, grow to that extent? No, I thought, you know what? If I raise 10,000 pounds, it'd be good. Yeah. But, there was a part of me that was nervous. Yeah. When I'm usually nervous about something, yeah. it usually does well. Yeah. I was nervous about it because in my head, I was like, oh my God, mm. what if there's too much money for me to handle on True. my own? Because yeah. it's a big responsibility. A lot of people mm. have trusted me with their money mm. and it, it scared me a little bit. There was a moment where I was dis not distressed, but I was, I was, I went, we went back to my nan's house in Istanbul mm. before I flew back. Mm. And I sat down and I was like talking to my dad. I'm like, oh, fuck, how am I going to post my fitness stuff now? I've got yeah. to run a business. People are going to misunderstand. There's going to be people that are going to think I went there to take two, a few fucking selfies with yeah. some kids yeah. and then just come back to normal fucking yeah. doing jujitsu, doing fitness, yeah. all of this mm. shit. But I was like, spoke to my dad about it, spoke to my good friends, family about it. They were like, dude, you just have to keep doing what you're doing. Yep. And then when the time comes, I'm going to use that money in the right places. I'm just yeah. going to wait. Nice. And I've got a few ideas. I want a school, mm. but I've got a few ideas mm. for, if not a school, something else mm. that I think can help them mentally. And I've been thinking mm. about this mm. and I want something to do with sports, mm. whether it's a school priority for sports, mm. athletes. Mm. And I've got something in my head. I and mean, luckily I've got the contacts to be able to fly, like, Imagine us when we're black belts. Yeah. And I'm like, Naz, yo, you want to go do a quick seminar at school, teach the kids some yeah. jiu-jitsu? Yeah, no, you know what I mean? What I've mean, got yeah. footballer friends. I've got yeah. athletes everywhere. There's, do you know what I mean? There's so many coaches that I yeah. know. So I want to see what I can do. But at the time, for the time, it's just going to be raise as much as possible. Yeah. And when the time is right, yeah. put it in the right places. Yeah. Put yeah. it in the right place. I don't yeah. want to just do it. You can't do anything now, bro. You have to wait for sort of the storm to pass because they're still seeking for bodies. They're still... Um, sending emergency help right right now. So at least, bro, at least for uh, at least for six seven months. Okay, at least when I go, I'm gonna go back next month. I'm mm -hmm. gonna chat to the people that I need to mm -hmm. chat to to like make like plans and all that sort of yeah. stuff. But I'm not gonna take action on it. I'm not gonna yeah. allow anyone's money go yeah. to waste. Yeah. I'm gonna make sure it's at the right time and the right place. Put it in the right place. So the result of it is like there's going to be impact from it basically. But do you think uh, the thing I loved about about that is you documented so much. Like I felt like I was part of the experience, uh, you know. Oh, good. And and luckily, I mean, uh, it sounds really selfish, but I wasn't involved 
Uh, it's not fair for me to say that was part of the of it, but no, you were, man. You raised your awareness, but, but I could see, I could see, like, oh, like uh, Darren and his dad are driving all this, all this distance, or Darren and, and his dad are doing this, and you know, and I think that's that's the key. It's like documenting it for people to see, uh, for us to find out sort yeah. of what the situation. is. I found out so much from you that I didn't necessarily find out from the news. So, oh, I pr I appreciate that. That's good. Mm. I wanted to do that. But mm. I also wanted people to see, like, um. I didn't actually want them to see, but I thought there might a lot of people, a lot of people that used to follow me, mm. refollowed me, okay, and sent me nice messages, okay, and all of this stuff. So it was it was actually quite weird because yeah. people are very quick to judge, mm. and uh, any opportunity to like mm. not like you, whether it's to make them feel better about themselves or whatever it is, um, they take that opportunity. But this time it was like the other way around, so people mm. were actually. Show me a lot of love, and the ones that didn't before, I think they saw me very differently. Because mm. I am a, mm. a chat. Not I don't chat a lot of shit on Instagram, but I am very like in your face. And blah, You're both blah, blah. extreme, isn't it? So yeah, yeah, I'm quite extreme. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like, I think people saw a side of me where, our oh, Diran's driven to make something happen. And for people that don't know, my name is Diran. Means Diran means resist, mm -hmm. and it comes from a political name from my family. <laughs> so my family are, that's how I was raised. Like yeah. to always. Do the, do the harder route. True. Uh, don't cut corners. Um, do mm. what's right. Be a good human. You always mm. win and whatnot. But we'll see what happens. I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy, but mm. hopefully it, I think it will put, give a positive impact for sure. True. It's also, what I've seen, it's also like made a lot of other like influencers, celebs, whatever, yep. take more action on it, nice. which is cool. And now, it's, you know what's funny? Mm -hmm. I'm getting all these big charities emailing me now. No way. Yeah, because they see the cash, bro. Oh, wow. They see the cash. So they're like, hey, Darren, can we help you with your blah, blah, blah? Oh, yeah. because yeah, they want the yeah, cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was quite, yeah, it's, it's quite funny. Mm. We'll see We'll see what happens. Mm. We'll see what happens. You were saying how, um, you are saying like the three core things. You are saying community. You are saying, mm. you are saying training and you are saying sleep. Mm. Sleep, training, sleep and training community is the three core things. Mm. But it's also the three core things like Western society is really fucking up with, right? Mm. Would you agree on that? Um, I feel like our society is improving its relationship to exercise. Um, I feel like um, nowadays, um, most gyms are jam-packed. I, I don't know about you, but I wait ages for a barbell. So that's a positive thing, I guess. I guess so, yeah. Um so I think the attitude to exercise is a positive one. Um, most people um, are involved in exercise. Uh, sleep, I'm so glad that we stepped out of that. Do you remember that grind culture? Like where people used to be like, oh, like I wake up at 3 a.m. I'll sleep sleeping. when I'm dead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, yeah. And it's literally, I mean, one of some of the, the worst things you could post possible advice you could possibly give to someone. Sleep is so crucial. Sleep itself is broken down into different stages. Uh, you have this slow wave deep sleep that happens sort of early at night. And then you have this rapid eye movement sleep uh, where you often dream and you're paralyzed. So you often find people can't actually move during rapid eye movement. AKA REM? REM sleep? REM, REM sleep, yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool. REM sleep. And what you find is slow wave sleep in particular is important because it's like the brain sewage system. So it cleans the brain from debris misfolding proteins, dead neurons. And without doing that, what you do is you accumulate toxic material in your brain. So it's so, so important for people to get their slow wave sleep. And slow wave sleep happens at the early phase of, of, of the night, like I said, of, of your sleep. And one of the w w easy ways that you can skip the slow wave sleep, what people do, is by, by going to bed one hour later than usual or two hours later than usual. Uh. People think that by going to bed one hour later and waking up one hour later uh, in the morning, that you'll be able to catch up on your entire sleep cycles. But what you do find is your body clock is set for you to go to bed at a particular time. So let's say if 10 p.m. is the usual time you go to bed, this is when perhaps 90 minutes after your slow wave sleep will kick in. This cleaning process of your brain will happen. The uh, restoration of your muscles, uh, of your body's uh, system and immune system happens during this phase. If you skip sleep or push sleep by an hour, 
what you what your body does is actually skip to some extent the slow wave sleep. So you don't do this cleaning process. It's almost like um, not cleaning your room for the for the next day ahead. You leave all the junk. Well, actually, a better example would be the kitchen. I'm sure you've you've seen this. Whenever you leave your dishes like, from, the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> from the night before, and you're like, okay, I'll do it tomorrow. Well, slow wave sleep acts as cleaning up the dishes, cleaning up the kitchen and the sink. And if you don't do that, you wake up the next day being like, oh no, I have to do all this. So you always start behind, the day behind or uh, in, in, your, in your recovery. So that's why it's important to maintain and create regularity, right? Regularity is very, very key. Sticking to the same sleeping schedules as much as possible. Even if you fail to sleep uh, one, one night, you had a bad night's sleep, what you should do is try not to nap during the day. Try mm-hmm. to maintain your regular sleep, sleeping schedule. Um, have an easier day. So let's say if you have a big gym workout that day, take it a little bit easier because you can actually, your immune system is it's in a weakened position. So you can actually overtrain yourself and, and, and potentially make yourself sick. So don't go as hard with your training, but don't also nap and, and just go to bed the normal way, uh, the normal time as, as possible. Amazing. And you were saying, okay, so that is like, it recycle, it gets rid of the rubbish, basically. Mm. Is that also why it's important to potentially avoid any light, TV light on your eyelids when you go into that um, section of your sleep? What was it called again? The first Slow wave sleep. Slow wave sleep. So yeah. if, say, for example, I've got the TV light or if, I, if my curtains are shit and the light's hitting mm. my eyelids, is that going to affect that process there? Yeah, no, 100%. Light is one of the most powerful... Um, experiences that you can you can implement in your life in a positive and negative way light in the morning especially natural light does wonders for you it uh, activates a a bunch of cascades neurochemical cascades that make you feel alert and motivated to tackle your day Um, it also triggers the release of melatonin uh, sort of a timer 12 12 hours later almost so you start to feel sleepy at night so light in the morning fantastic Light at night, pre-bed, so let's say before you fall asleep, uh, is terrible. It's associated with depression and anxiety. And it's also associated with a dysfunctional dopamine system, uh, the system for effort and persistence and rewards. In addition to this, uh, what you do find is even when you're fully asleep, they've done experiments, a bit of dim light in your eye can affect your ability to recall memories the next day. So you're fully knocked out. You're yeah. not aware of this. In experiments, they expose you to a brief ex- exposure of dim light. And what you find is that the next day, people who were exposed to the dim light performed uh, much worse than those who didn't. So dim light is terrible for you. And one easy hack that people can implement is using an eye mask. Mm. So an eye mask is a cheap sort of tool that one can implement. It's not super fancy supplement that people love yeah my eye mask cost me four pounds from h&m i think yeah. and you pop that in your eyes um and assuming that the, the the light isn't super super strong you cut out all that that exposure to dim light at night all the all the lights that you mentioned the artificial light and on top of that it's been proven that wearing an eye mask in athletes can improve reaction time mm. it can actually improve performance the next day because they're getting better recovery Better recovery, yeah. That's one of the potential mechanisms. Mad. It's just not a sexiest thing when you've got a girl over and you just put them on my mask. On. <laughs> well, you just have to put it on, uh, you know, get it done, you know. <laughs> so, okay. That's great. Now, you mentioned dopamine. Yeah. Dopamine's good, right? But can it also be... Is it becoming more dangerous now than good? Because I feel like... We had this chat in it mm. after like I came back from uh, Australia I think, I from tour. Yeah. We were sitting down on the mats and I was talking about like dopamine. I'm just like getting too many spikes of it everywhere with everything that I'm doing. Yeah. And things are starting to become mundane. Yeah. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Like cool things that I thought were absolutely amazing. Yeah. And like I feel like I needed to bring it back a level, you know? And like, and you told me a few things there that was yeah. like, kind of blew my mind and I think yeah. people need to address. Do you remember some of those things that you mentioned? Yeah, no, totally. Know? Yeah, totally. Well, what happens is if you reward yourself with high levels of dopamine 
activities with high levels of dopamine or drugs that release a lot of dopamine in you. Um, those kind of things will increase the threshold required for you to continue to enjoy that thing. So dopamine itself is this, uh, people call it a neurohormone, some people call it a neurotransmitter, is extremely potent. It's uh, produced in a couple of structures in your brain. Uh, the substantia nigra is one of those structures. Ventral tegmental area is another structure. So these are sort of at the base of your brain. It's particularly important for movement uh, because what you find in Parkinson's disease, uh, the dopaminergic neurons tend to be affected. Okay. And that's what's associated with the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. But on the sort of, in everyone else or, or as a general, it's associated with, it's the molecule of effort, motivation, persistence, and reward to some extent. Okay. And we all have this baseline of dopamine on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, that's to some extent genetically inherited. And based on your activities on a day-to-day -day basis, you experience these dopamine hits, so dopamine spikes. And for example, cocaine or MDMA or caffeine, these things spike your dopamine to alcohol, different levels. Alcohol, alcohol yeah. yeah. Particularly those drugs that I mentioned, they completely sort of exponentially increase your level of dopamine. So this is why some people become addicted. Uh, you find is uh, the, the spike in dopamine is so high that um, you have to constantly chase those spikes. But going back to the baseline, so we all have a baseline and every time you do something you enjoy, you experience a spike in that mm -hmm. dopamine. You have now increased the number of conditions required for you to get that hit. And at the same time, you've lowered your baseline level on dopamines. So the more you do the things you enjoy, the lower your dopamine baseline gets. So okay. you start from a lower position yeah, yeah, yeah. and the number of conditions required for you to enjoy that particular activity increases. So you have to make up that gap. Mm. So that's why people seek more and more extreme behaviors. Yeah. They're no longer satisfied with um, doing the same, the same particular activity in that, in that particular way. That's how you overdose, right? So, that's how you overdose from a drug sense. Um, it's one of the potential theories. Um, another, and another thing is first, you, let's say you buy a car or you buy something that you enjoy, you're super excited about yeah, it. Yeah. And then over time, because it's the same thing over and over again, um, yeah, what you do is you stop yeah. enjoying, enjoying. Which is some of the stuff. Yeah, by the way, guys, I wasn't, I'm, I don't do drugs in it. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't talking about me. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the stuff I spoke to you about was yeah. like, hey, I bought, I bought, I had a brand new Range Rover. Yeah, uh, yeah. I bought a nice watch. I bought a nice, got nice trainers. I live in like somewhere nice now. And um, I was lucky enough for work. They flew me business class everywhere. Mm. And it all became a bit... Overwhelming, right? Yeah, yeah. It all became like that. And I was just like, even now I've changed my car. I've got myself a Golf. Mm. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it's just... And I'm enjoying it so much more. Yeah. And it's like, it's less stress. Yeah. And when you told me that stuff, I was like, because I had a big peak of... Mm. Um, or constant peaks. Constant peaks. Yeah. Constant peaks. I had to bring it down. Yeah. And I was doing, I was literally like, when my car got stolen, mm. I was walking from like mm. uh, Wandsworth to um, Hammersmith yeah. for Jits every day. Yeah. And like without any music and yeah. I was just like staring at the yeah. floor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was weirdly very therapeutic. Like, yeah, of course. Yeah. I was enjoying it. Yeah. I was enjoying like not having anything. And I feel like I saw an element of, oh, I can see where like, okay, let's be honest. I'm some B-Tech celebrity. I've got some, <laughs> I've got some followers on Instagram, but mm. I'm a B-Tech celebrity, right? Mm. I'm not, some people know me, but it's not like, mm. I'm not like these guys where they have access to crazy shit and yeah. are so distance from general public, yeah. right? Yeah. I got a glimpse in my head of like, no wonder these guys are fucked. Mm. Like, no wonder they got so many problems, man. Like, yeah. how the hell would they cope? I mean, you get people, uh, celebrities that are suicidal. Mm. And I'm not saying I was there. Yeah, yeah. I'm not comparing myself to that at all. But I saw like a very small glimpse of what they might feel on a different scale. Now you were talking about dopamine, right? Those hits, we become numb to them, right? Mm. If that is consistently quite mm. high. Now, one of the, not for myself, I think I've got good control over it. I'm on mm. social media quite mm. a bit for work purposes. But you get a lot of people wake up and the first thing that they do is they go on Instagram yeah. and they see something funny, yeah. sexy, yeah. educational, something that spikes yeah. Yeah. dopamine. Yeah. How negative is that? How yeah. bad or how good is that? 
So what's interesting about social media is, um, like you said, you get that peak, like a spike in dopamine whenever you, you first grab your phone, you see something interesting and you get that notification or you get that message. But the algorithms of social media apps, and we're talking about particularly Instagram and TikTok, they're designed to keep you scrolling. So social media by on itself, there's nothing really inherently wrong with it. In many ways, it provides huge benefits. It allows us to connect with people on the other side of the globe. It's, it's a huge technical um, tech um, advantage that we have through, the, through, this, um, through this, uh, this system or this, this device. But it's the constant act of uh, scrolling that becomes sort of almost addictive. And what you do find is these algorithms on social media, they're designed to keep you scrolling. And I can give you an example of that. What you often find is people are grabbing uh, their phones and every five or six videos, you see something that grabs your attention. Mm -hmm. I'm sure like, I'm sure you've, you might have experienced this on Reels or on TikTok. You're looking and you're like, skip, no, boring, boring, boring. And then, wow, this yes. is amazing. And that's all your brain requires for, keep, for you to keep scrolling. You, you almost like become addicted to this searching for that dopamine hit. And it's that constant scrolling that's the most problematic that people need to really uh, think about. And I'm assuming the algorithms, mm -hmm. um, they notice how long you hold on that video. Mm -hmm. Then they push more videos like that towards you. Yeah, so exactly the and accounts you, you follow. On. Exactly the accounts you follow, the things you like, how long you watch that video. All of these are parameters that these big social media app companies are using to predict um, at which point is this person really like enjoying this. And then they're going to kind of filter it. So every six, seven videos or 10 videos, those kind of videos will pop up. TikTok and Instagram, Facebook. I bet they've got like this massive fucking meeting room where they have like 50 guys as smart as you sitting there going, okay, how can we make people stay on the platform? That's probably their job, isn't it? I bet they have that in there, which is crazy. Yeah. And um, you mentioned also, um, we spoke about a little bit, mm. um, visual, visual, yeah. visualization. Now, I feel like I'm someone that visualizes quite a bit. Um what I wasn't doing very well until kind of recently is reflecting mm. back on things and mm. addressing certain things about myself and like really looking at it and learning from certain actions I've taken in my life. Um, how important and how true can your dreams come true when visualizing something? Do you know what's interesting? Um, my relationship with visualization is an interesting one. Okay, yeah. Because I had for a long time my rigid scientific hat where I was like, what is this? You know, it's, is it a genuine thing? Like, is this actually beneficial for, for people to implement in their lives? And the more I started looking at the literature, the more I realized that visualization is actually a super effective uh, tool. And I would combine it very closely with positive self-talk. Visualization, positive self-talk, they go hand in hand. There are so many studies um, that, that looked at those things. One particular study that I found interesting was a group of researchers invited tennis players on the court and instructed them to serve the ball. And one group of tennis players were told to visual visualize them serving the ball and also engage in positive self-talk, tell themselves, I can do this, or imagine themselves uh, actually serving the ball. The other group wasn't told any sort of instruction. What they found is the group that were, that were involved in the visualization or positive self-talk served more accurately and efficiently and consistently than those who didn't engage in the visualization and positive self-talk. Now, visualization and positive self-talk is thought to activate uh, the primary motor cortex or primary for action. So this is a particular structure important for, for motor movement. So that ready is almost sort of like feeding it. Yeah, you're almost like, you know, preheating the oven okay. before you're actually cooking the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just the visualization and the positive self-talk is making your brains, your neurons, we say in neuroscience, ready to fire. They're ready for action. And all you need to do is serve. So this is a perfect example of how people should implement visualization and positive self-talk in their lives. And that explains it with the tennis players because tennis players are fucking crazy. Like, <laughs> you need to almost be deluded if you want to be, if you want to get to that level of success, right? Like, you almost need to believe some unbelievable things 
right? Like, if you don't have that sort of belief, how do you even get to that level? I mean, especially tennis players. Yeah. They're on their own on the court. Yeah. Um, it's a lonely sport, right? It's lonely. Yeah. I mean, the ones that play at the top level, yeah. they're pretty fucking mental, let's yeah. be honest. Yeah. And they're pretty, they have to have like an element of crazy. Big personalities. Big personalities yeah. or just big introverts. Like, I don't know, mm. I guess people that, I guess, are forced to be alone. And because you have to be really competitive. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you've got teammates. But think about it also. It's like, these are kids that probably sacrifice so many years of of the sort of the funnest years as a as a teenager or, yeah. or even as children. Um, I, I think of Djokovic, for example, who I know as a, as a child and as a teenager was traveling all, all around the world, leaving his family, let's say, to train. But I don't think this is purely specific to tennis players. No. I think course. it's like, it's, um, I mean, tennis players, especially as you said, this uh, sort of uh, lone wolves in a way, yeah. they're acting on by themselves. But this idea that, you know, obviously the success you're required for tennis or for football or yeah. for these kind of things is um yeah, it's very impressive and yeah. i think that's what most people struggle with uh with attaining those heights is continuing to make those sacrifices yeah i guess i mean self-belief is one do you know what i mean like mm -hmm. a lot of people um are not great at it it's usually ones that are quite like that mm -hmm. tend to do i guess successful things or things mm -hmm. that are more in people's eyes. Do you know mm. what I mean? How much would you say you visualize now? By the way, I was mentioning yeah. the tennis thing because yeah. with with team sports, it's harder to yeah. pinpoint. Whereas yeah. with tennis players, like a serve, a point. You look at them, yeah. It's more specific. I feel jujitsu is a little bit similar too, in a yeah. way. Because I, I, the contrast between training in the gym and going to compete is so different. Yeah. I'm not going to compete. Uh, the RGA boys are no longer there. You know, you're there on your own and yeah. yes, they're there to support you, but someone's actually trying to hurt you on the other side. Yeah. So it's, it's a very, it feels a little bit lonely in a way. Yeah. Um, that has positive consequences because in a way, you, you know, you get ramped up and you're like, okay, like I'm ready. Yeah. And I'm on my own. But on the other hand, I see what you mean by, uh, by comparing them or by mentioning tennis players. It's like, it's quite a similar experience. And it's, I, that's what I love about competitions, actually. Mm. Like, mm. I feel like that we, when we roll, Mm. You're very technical. Mm. You're way more technical than me. You're way more technical than me. Mm. I'll just say I'm probably stronger mm. than you. A, a little, little bit. bit a, little a little bit. bit a little bit, bit stronger. <laughs> a little bit. But like, when we're rolling, we don't go crazy hard. No. We're like very flowy, very like yeah. whatever, let it go. But if you catch me, you catch me. If yeah, I yeah. catch you, I catch you, whatever. Um, it's most of the time you catch me. Yeah, <laughs> but um, by the way, that's is a freak in Nogi. He's very good. Very good Nogi. Um, I'm, guy. I'm scared to put the gear on the gear. So. <laughs> yeah. And, um, when you were saying stuff about comp and um, like training, I feel like I'm someone that does better in competitions than I do at training. Now, I don't know if it's because I've set this thing in my head of visualizing that I do better at competition than I do at training. But when I'm at training with you boys, I can't like completely shut off and mm. go, I can't yeah, go yeah, full, yeah. full like, yeah, just comp mode. Yeah, comp yeah. mode with people that I know quite well. Yeah. But, but but then I'm in my head when I'm on a match when there's a like, in mm. essence, a stage, mm. and it's someone else where you don't have to be polite. Yeah. I've always visualized myself as yeah. just like winning, 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 and I feel yeah. like I've done well by having yeah. that mentality. Yeah. Do you think that can hinder me being too nice on a training? Can hinder competition days? I think definitely to some extent. I definitely think like the more you match your training to your actual competition it is great. But you also need to realize that training is for learning. Competition is for performance. They're two different aspects. During training, this is your time for trial and error, for you to experiment your new game, for you to experiment new techniques that you've been taught. It's not the time to always go hard and without really processing the moves that you're actually performing. This is the time to slow down and experiment. This is why you and I train really well. I give you a certain reaction and then you give me a certain reaction. Yeah. We go back and forth. My aim is not just to beat you. There's an element of competitiveness in it. Yeah. But my aim isn't to just make this a boring sort of either I dominate you or you dominate me because it's training. Yeah, obviously, if you and I face in a comp and I didn't know you, then it'd be really It'd be competitive. Different. Yeah, yeah. But so. I, I know the answer to that. Yeah. Why I have great roles with you and why yeah. you're the similar like that as well. Yeah why I can't have those sort of roles with some people. Yeah. And I think it all just comes down to ego. Yeah. Like, I have no shame whatsoever if you tap me out. Yeah. Which is why 
I go for mad fucking moves. Like you and me end up in some weird fucking yeah. positions sometimes. Yeah. And it comes from like... We're just experimenting. Being right? creative, yeah, yeah. right? But whereas if you're with someone that's got a mad ego and you can yeah. just see they're just out to get you, you just yeah. can't be that relaxed, can you? No, you can't be that relaxed. I always try to match the intensity of the person at the very least. Um, I'm quite lucky I'm getting to a stage where I'm experienced enough to uh, handle most people. So I don't have to worry about it too much. And the really technical guys tend to be really controlled. Yeah. So you won't have that worry. It tends to be the more beginner sort of blue belt phase uh, some purple belts that still sort of go At really, really phase. hard. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm the same. Personally, like, and actually, you know what? Like, whenever I get tapped, I'm like, okay, why did I get tapped? And I try to understand and implement changes so it doesn't happen again. Yeah. That's my aim, like, really. It's not It's not to just beat you there or yeah. beat someone else because why? Who cares? Yeah. Like, you don't get mad at yourself for it. You try to figure it out. No, exactly. Yeah. For me, it's like, a, it's so clear cliche or cringy but it's like a problem solving activity yeah it is yeah like I really for me the reason jujitsu really clicks with me is because I'm going there to problem solve yeah it's a, basically the same thing as I'm not sure if you've ever looked at a series of codes on a on a computer program you're basically running some if statements if my partner does this I do this else if my partner does this I do this. Mm. So I have a reaction for. for every single thing you do and similar similar, similar way around. You can actually code jujitsu. I think at some point in the future, you can actually code the map, code the players or, or the fighters and code a series of actions and pretty much simulate a jujitsu fight. <laughs> You're talking like John Dana. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, okay, so, so to be able to do, um, to be able to train well, to be able to do anything well, to be able to accomplish anything, we need a level of focus, yeah. right? We need to be able to focus well. Now, I'll be honest, at school, I was terrible. Mm. Um, I don't know if I got ADHD. I don't know if I have ADHD or whatever, mm -hmm. but um, I can't focus for shit, brother, unless mm -hmm. I'm really interested, mm -hmm. which is why in sports I did well, because I was interested. Mm. Jiu-Jitsu is probably one of the really few places other than some work things that I do, mm. where when I sit down and the professor's talking, mm -hmm. um, I'm fully listening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, my brain is fully there and it's mm -hmm. not wandering. But there's some things where I can't focus. Mm. How do we improve focus? Like mm. with my brain, if my brain is scattered and it's all over mm. the place, how do I improve that? Is it my environment? Is it the people? Mm. Is it planning? How, mm. how would you improve that? What tips would you give for someone that struggles with focus? Yeah, no, I think it's important to distinguish between uh, people that actually have uh, uh, ADHD um, because that's a whole separate category. Yeah. Um, I think there's obviously still a lot of people that are underdiagnosed for ADHD, which is a, an, an, another issue. But as a general rule, uh, for focus, you need to get those fundamentals right. And that, that includes seven to eight hours of sleep. That includes regular exercise, a combination of cardiovascular and resistance training. Yeah. Um, you need to make sure that you're getting uh, sufficient sunlight exposure uh, in the morning and no... A light exposure, artificial light exposure at night. So yeah. those kind of the fundamental social yeah. interaction we've spoken about. On top of that, one of the one of the easy ways or one of the sort of um, detailed or systemized way, that's a better word, systemized way to improve your focus in certain activities is to gradually increase the amount of exposure that you're to, to that exact activity. Okay. So for example, a lot of people ask me, I want to meditate or I want to sit down for, for 10 minutes yeah. and actually improve my focus. But they're like, after one minute, I just want to get up and I don't want to do it. Yeah. But why are you aiming for 10 minutes? Aim for one minute. Set a timer. One minute, I'm going to sit down and whatever happens, I'm going to stay focused in focus or sort of meditate for that one particular minute. Or after once you've done that, then increase that by two minutes or three minutes. So gradually every day you increase the amount of time exposed in that environment. In terms of work productivity, there's evidence that our brains work in this ultra circadian rhythm, yeah. which basically means that our brain best operates in 90 minute chunks. Okay. So people that try, that try to like work five hours in a row, that's not optimal. That's not the optimal way for your brain to work. What you actually need to do is set 90 minute timers and take a break of 10 minutes, 90 minute timer, set a break of 10 minutes. That's an easy sort of tool that you can implement in your day-to-day -day basis, if that's possible, possible okay. within your work, um, your work capacity. The other thing you could do is if you're working on a computer, is to avoid looking down at the computer. 
a lot of people are sort of working down and looking down. But basically, whenever you look down, you activate certain neurons that make you feel more sleepy and lethargic. Really? Yeah. When you're looking down? When you're looking down. So when you're like, let's say, because your body is basically telling you you're kind of in a, like that rest mode. Question. Yeah. Would that also affect people with their postures like that? Because, you know, pe ten, people that tend to be quite shy, maybe introverts, no, mm. I, I won't say introverts, but people that are quite shy, people that are always lethargic, people mm. that are always fucking moaning mm. and always complaining, mm. they all tend to walk and look down. Yeah. Could you I, know what? That's actually a very good hypothesis. I don't think it's been tested. But the general idea is like special special cells in your in your eyes that basically send those signals mm. to the base of your brain telling you whether you should be alert or awake. So potentially, I mean, you could design an experiment that, that that's a perfect experiment right. for you to, to you test. You can do it, bruv. I can be the... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You're smart. I'm not smart enough to do that. You can do it, bruv. But on the other hand, if you want to stay focused, what you want to do is see if you can place your laptop on a series of books or maybe like elevated screen and then uh, sort of look up a little bit more. And what you do, you, you will find is your alertness will increase. You'll be more sort of productive and feel less sleepy. Okay. You said something about meditation where you should sit for one minute yeah. and then progressively like, yeah. I guess. Progressive like, overload. Progressive overload training. Yeah. <laughs> and I've, there's, there's a few meditation people I've had on the podcast and I spoke to. Yeah. They always say, no, no, sit there for 20 minutes yeah. and force it. What would you say to that? What you say where like you do a minute and you yeah. overload, is that like is that like from a study or something? Or yeah. is that something that you've seen that yeah. helps people improve? Because they're like, no, nah, 20 minutes, you zone out and you do what you can to like fight that, fight your focus or whatever. I mean, in an ideal world, that's what you want. Okay. So th those people are not wrong. Yeah. But the thing is, You've mentioned that you really struggled or people really struggle to really sit down. Most people do, yes. Exactly. So if you can, for example, myself, I, like everyone else, I have impulses and I want, want to go on my phone or I want to be, I'm distracted. But I can sit 20 minutes. I have mm -hmm. that capacity. Okay. But some people don't. Yes. And some people like will give up. They won't wait 20 minutes. They'll, they'll just scrap the entire experiment. So my point is for those particular people, you want to start small steps, one minute, two minutes. Perhaps start a little bit higher than one minute. Perhaps start mm. by five minutes. Okay. This is your five minute uh, starter and then six minutes the next day. The way it works is basically by re con constantly repeating this sort of pattern of activity and also increasing the difficulty every day. You basically sort of rewire your brain. You actually rewire the connections of neurons involved in that particular behavior. And the more they're, they're co-active, we say, the more these neurons supporting that behavior are active at the same time, the longer you are or, or the better able you will be to sit down. So, yeah, I, th I okay. think people should just like start slowly. Yeah. Uh, this kind of mentality it's of more like... more realistic. Yeah, but why, why are you trying to accomplish everything I want? I mean, if you have the capacity, fantastic. But... Um, Most people don't. Yeah, like it's like, for example, like in your program, people come up to you and say, um, uh, Darren, I want to, you know, deadlift a certain amount. And you're like, okay, well, listen, why don't we start with 60 kilogram deadlift first yeah. and then we'll increase it by 65 yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. a month later. You know, like, let's do a progressive overload, right? Of course, yeah. No, I, I definitely agree with that. What if, say if you can't meditate, right? Yeah. And um, when I um, when I was in Turkey, I was in my dad's, um, yeah. literally last week, when we came out of Karaman Marash, we, we went past my dad's village, yeah. uh, which is very close. And it was, it's, it's uh, snowing there now. The mountains are full of snow. It's fucking yeah. beautiful, like yeah. nature. I've never, first time I went to my dad's village in the winter. Yeah. And it was amazing. I loved it more than I do in the summer. Yeah. And once I came out of the chaos and bro, nature, yeah. Yeah. The mountains and that quiet is like. Bro, I have a good study about this. It's beautiful. It's scary, you know. Yeah. There's like element of like fear there but it makes it fucking sexy I don't know yeah. it sounds weird yeah. but like I, my dad was like you coming in into my yeah. like dad's uncle's house um, I was like I'll come in in a bit I just want to sit here Yeah. I literally sat on I just sat on like a piece of wood looking up to the mountains nice um, we're talking kilometers of mountains yeah, yeah, yeah. and just pure white yeah. and silence yeah, yeah. yeah just 10 minutes I didn't close my eyes or anything yeah. I just like yeah. breathed Mm. And I was just looking around mm. and it felt like meditating. Yeah, yeah. It felt yeah. like I was on mushrooms, bro. <laughs> it just felt yeah. like, I was like, oh my God, my brain has actually just relaxed. Yeah, yeah. Like after the stuff that I've seen, you know? And 
So if you can't meditate, can you just sit there? Yeah. You can? So sit there as in just, sit in, the, in, in nature? Just anywhere. Like just, because sometimes yeah. the pressure of meditation yeah. can be too much for a lot of people because yeah. they don't know what to expect. Yeah. But we do know what to expect when you sit there and do nothing. It's just sitting let, there Let me nothing. answer this question by first telling you about an interesting study okay. on uh, going outside and being exposed to blue and green environments. So green environments are like parks and forests and those kind of things. And blue environments are like um, rivers and lakes and oceans and, and those kind of things. And there was a big study done in Finland where they basically collected data on about 20,000 participants. And they collected information on how often these people visited those places. And at the same time, they also asked them, sort of, let us know what medication you're taking, how often you're taking medication. And they, what they found is the more you visited green and blue places, the less medication you actually had to take. Or these people took less medication. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I mean, some of the potential mechanisms are things like increased opportunities for exercise, um, increased social interaction, opportunities for social interaction, like we spoke about. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is this idea that whenever you're stressed or anxious, you tend to often sort of narrow your visual field to a very small window. Okay. You tend to s stare and almost internalize all your stress. That's what you often find. Whenever you're dealing with a problem that's happening around you, your visual field just narrows. Yeah. Going on a walk in nature means that you have a wide visual field. So whenever you're stressed, you actually want to widen this visual field. And going on a walk, looking around, you gave the example of the mountain, looking around actually reduces activity in the structure associated with fear processing in the brain. The structure is called the amygdala. So activation in that structure reduces because of you looking around and because of widening your visual field. So as a tool for people to implement as part of in addition to meditation, is to just go for a walk. Uh, no phones or, or no music, but just completely, just like, admire the environment around you. Move your eyes around. That's an easy way for you to reduce stress. And that's why you should get your knee up 24-7. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because that whole thing came from when I was really stressed. Yeah. And I was going for a bad time. That helped you, didn't it? it I was walking my problems away. Yeah, 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 <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Anytime I'm stressed or if I'm in some argument or something, I walk away. Yeah. I need, to, I need to exert some level of energy yeah, yeah. Some, somewhere else. Because you're you widening your visual field, you see. Yes. Would you say, I would say I'm a very visual person, like mm. visual learner. Um, tell me to sit down and read a book. Mm. It would be very difficult. But if you and me went on a walk and had a conversation yeah. about neuroscience, I'd probably learn all of it and I'll take yeah. it in like a sponge. Now, if I'm someone that is a very visual person, yeah. would that be more beneficial? That action be more beneficial for a visual person or would it be the same for everyone? Mm, I'm not sure if it's super related, <laughs> okay, but that's cool. a that's another hypothesis you could gen generate. Okay. I do think learning and sort of your ability to sort of um, reduce stress are slightly unrelated in this particular matter. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like for example, I'm not particularly visual. I'm visual, like, but but not particularly. But I love a walk and, and going around. And, okay, you know what I mean. So I don't think they perfectly map one to one. But once again, listen, it depends. We'll start a lab one day and we'll run a bunch of experiments. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. This one experiment uh, that I was telling you about, I was going to tell you about. Yeah. Fascinating experiment. Is this your favorite one? It's one of my favorite it's ones. One of your yeah. favorite ones. Yeah. It's it's astonishing. So it's been done in um, John Hopkins University. It's a, it's a lab uh, in there that have done this experiment. And basically they study octopus or octopi in this particular group, so a bunch of them. And what they found is uh, generally octopi tend to be quite um, sort of not lonely, but sort of independent creatures. Unless they're mating, they stay in their corner. They don't really uh, interact with other octopi. So there's one hypothesis that uh, this experimental group generated is whether the serotonin system, so there's the system associated with feeling happy and satisfied, is similar in hippocampi, that, uh, sorry, not hippocampi, oct oct octopi, that is to us. So they wanted to investigate whether the, the, human, the human brain and the octopi brain behave kind of similarly. So they put this, these octopi in water immersed with MDMA. Yeah. Okay. And basically, like, uh, what they found is when they put these octopi uh, in groups, usually they would, like, kind of, like, separate from each other. What they found is these octopi started cuddling and interacting. <laughs> so they absorbed the MDMA 
And MDMA is known to increase your serotonin level. It makes you very cuddly. And Oh, I've seen yeah. a lot of people in Ibiza take MDMA and become yeah. very cuddly and yeah. fall in love, bro. Yeah, yeah, I feel you. So it seems that the, the genes that code uh, serotonin, this particular chemical that I mentioned in humans, uh, also overlap with those of octopi. And so, yeah, what you find is a bunch of um, <laughs> octopi that are like cuddly and, and want to interact with each other. It's fascinating. That right? is very fascinating. Have you watched that documentary on Netflix with the guy that interacts with the octopus? What is it called? I don't think I've watched it. Have you not watched it? I watched is it, it during COVID, but it was weird. This guy yeah. goes into the ocean every day, finds yeah. the same octopus for a whole year or something. No way. They have this weird relationship. I need to, I need to check this Legit, out. Legit, bro. You'd love it. We're going to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you'd love it. Yeah. I was like, I don't know how I... I kept watching it. It was very... Is it like one of those, like, when you go on YouTube and you end up in, like, a uh, random... No, it was on Netflix. I saw it. Yeah. Let me click it. And I was like, this is a bit weird. This guy having some weird interaction with an octopus. And you checked it out, yeah. He documented it for, like, over a year and Amazing. a half or something. Amazing. And they built this relationship. <laughs> how did they know How did he know it was the same octopus? Did he, like, tag it with, like, a particular thing? No, he just, just recognized... He, it, the octopus ended up yeah. cuddling him a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, like, you yeah. watch it and you'll be... Okay. You, I reckon you'll like it. Yeah, you'll like cool. it. Cool, check it out. But, um, Bro, uh, it was great having you on. Yeah, and that was good. This chat. was this was long. This was good fun. Yeah, you need to come on more often. Yeah. I love it. Anytime there's like a new study on this sort of stuff. Yeah, um, you got to come here and share it. Let's do it. And we've got to do a lot of. Um, I always have these weird like you know you said well, you need to open a lab and we'll do all yeah. of this stuff. There's a lot of things mm. that in my mind correlate and make sense. I don't have proof though. Yeah, and I can't generate proof, bro. I'm not. I'm not smart like you, innit? But it doesn't mean that it's false. You just have to test it. I know, but I have this like core, like, <laughs> like when I, I see some things and I'm like, I know this is true, but yeah. I can't explain it. It's just yeah. like when I see someone that I don't like, I yeah. just like, I know that person's a bad person. Yeah. I don't even know how to explain it, but I can yeah. just pick up energy that this person's a prick. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But we'll, we'll talk about that another yeah. time. But um, anyway, thank you for coming on. Cool. Um, where can people find you if they want to follow you? Naz Neuro on Instagram. Yes, uh, Naz is definitely dropping, he's dropping a lot of fun facts, yeah. a lot of Naz bombs. Naz Wait, that's bombs. your new hashtag. That's what they call it, yeah. Naz bombs, <laughs> Naz bombs, yeah. Naz bombs ones, Naz bomb Sundays. Okay. Um, thank you for coming on, bro. I really okay. appreciate no, thanks, you. Darren. And I can't wait to choke you out of training. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right, take care. Take care, guys. Make sure you share the podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed it and subscribe to the channel, share the love and yeah. And also, this episode is sponsored by Darren Cartel. Go sponsor the GoFund page. I'm going to help out a lot of kids in Turkey and Syria. Peace and love. Take it easy. Bye. Bye.